Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start by talking about habitat loss, although I feel a bit silly now for, about after this amazing talk about the predictors of extinction, but well, habitat loss has been linked to extinctions, and nowadays, actually, is the number one threat to biodiversity. Uh, through a geological time, habitat loss caused by sea level has been associated with extinction events. After the last mass extinction event, the most dramatic changes in sea level have been had occurred during the Pliocene and Pleistocene. Although these changes in sea level have been associated with extinctions, for example, the regional extinctions in the Caribbean of some corals, it has been assumed or it has been proposed that they didn't really have any effect in the um, survival of marine vertebrates. However, we know that some marine vertebrates became extinct around that time. We have the case of the biggest shark that ever lived, Megalodon, which I have studied a, a lot, and also um, species of sea turtles, uh, marine birds, and also mammals. We know there is a very classical case of a drop in diversity of marine mammals around that time. So the first question we wanted to answer was whether these extinctions were isolated examples of if they were part of an extinction event. To answer these questions, we wanted to assess extinction rates through time. And we use this powerful method that is PyRate. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's a new method that was uh, developed, a new software that was developed by Daniel Silvestro, in which you have, um, in this case, we gather a, a set of data from the paleobiology database, and we calculated the three things that PyRate calculates. One is origination and extinction time of each taxa based on the, all the occurrences and also sampling probabilities and recovering probabilities. And with that, you calculate extinction rates. So we found that extinction rates of the Pli Pliocene was three times higher than the mean Cenozoic value and actually significantly higher than any other epoch for marine megafauna. When we look at this on a continuous time scale, we found that actually it was the late Pliocene where extinction rates were the highest. Looking at proportional extinctions, we found that different animals, different taxa, or different clades were affected differently. Mammals and turtles were more affected than sharks, for example. But when you take the whole marine megafauna as a whole, then we found that 36% of the Pliocene taxa failed to cross to the Pleistocene. So one third of marine megafauna became extinct. The next question we wanted to answer was whether this was caused by sea level changes and area loss. So to do that, my collaborator, Sara Varela, used these two proxies of sea level, in which for each of these sea level scenarios, this is every 10, 100, no, 100,000 years, she calculated the depth of the global ocean, and we isolated those cells that were less than 200 meters. That would be a coastal area in our study and we assess the area that will be lost or the area remaining in each of these 11 scenarios. What we found was that there was a dramatic drop in area during the late Pliocene, and afterwards, there were very violent oscillations. Actually, all this variation of the Pleistocene was three times higher than the variation of the Pliocene. But most importantly, the total area of the Pleistocene was 30% less than one of the Pliocene. We proposed that this was a key driver of the extinction of marine megafauna, and this was corroborated by further analysis that we performed. So my collaborator, John Griffin, um, did these generalized linear models in which we assigned traits to each genera, traits such as thermoregulation, habitat, feeding mechanisms, or feed, feeding zone, sorry, diet, and body size. We found that from all these traits, Thermoregulation was the most important trait, or was the trait that better predicted this extinction. Within thermoregulation, <coughs> omnothermic animals, mesotherms and endotherms, those capable to control their body temperatures, had higher chances of going extinct, as opposed to poikilotherms or ectothermic sharks. Well, we know that omnothermic animals are capable of maintaining their body temperature regardless <coughs> of the ambient temperature, whereas poikilotherms, they vary their temperature with the ambient temperature. But for these animals, homeothermic animals, to be able to control their internal temperatures, they need more resources than poikilotherms because they need to maintain these metabolic demands to be able to control their body temperatures. That's the reason why we think this corroborates this area hypothesis because 
when you need a lot of resources, you need a lot of ARIA. And if ARIA is diminished, then you have less availability of resources. That is as opposed to if temperature was a key driver, because in that case, we would have expected for per kiloterms to be more affected. An earlier study that I did during my PhD showed that our actually uh, temperature didn't really affect the distribution and extinction of mesothermic animals, for example. But the main question that we wanted to answer was the ecological effects of this extinction for marine ecosystems. To answer this question, we use a functional diversity approach. And we use these methods by milieu and collaborators, which, is, which are used in modern ecology. So according with these methods, you have a sample of species and you measure some traits. And based on these traits, you, you build this multivariate uh, space based on a principal coordinate um, approach and then you construct a functional space. Then you have presence and absence of species or general, whatever taxa, in different communities, and you regard the volume of the space as a functional richness and the lack of overlap between two spaces as a functional shift. So we did that, but in this case, not for the entire Cenozoic, but only for the Pliocene and Pleistocene. We assigned traits, as in the previous analysis, body size, diet, habitat, zone, and thermal regulation, and we build two spaces based on the presence and absence of these species in a, in a community. So this is what we found. This is the space for the Pliocene, so before the extinction, and the Pleistocene after the extinction. Each dot here represents a functional entity, not a species. For example, this one here and here is all animals that are more than 12 meters of total length, that are macro predators, pelagic, coastal, and mesotherm. So body size, diet, habitat, thermoregulation. In this case, only one species fills this, um, this group. This case is of the megalodon. So seven of these groups became extinct during this extinction. And four evolved in the Pleistocene. Once we accounted for sampling differences between these two communities, we found, and we run 10,000 or 1,000 iterations, we found that in the Pleistocene, the functional space, the functional richness was 15% less than in the Pliocene. That's without <coughs> accounting for the new species that evolved. But we would, have, we would account for that, the change was 16%. So actually, the new arrivals or the new, the new species that evolved didn't compensate for the species that was lost. We also found a shift of 20%. So, Seven functional entities were lost, 15% of the space was lost, 20% of shift. This sounds like very modest numbers. Of course, it wasn't massive. But when you compare that with other examples or other studies that have used a similar approach, it's actually quite big. Because similar studies that have used this approach found that after mass extinction events, when you do 70 or 90% of the taxa, only one function is lost. So, how come? How come some species or some functions on some animals are more resilient to not lose this functional space of functional diversity? Well, it depends on two things. One is the range of functions, so different animals doing different things, but also the redundancy. How many species are playing that function? For example, if you have a system like this, where you have high redundancy and you experience an extinction, then you don't lose the functions because at least there's one species left playing that function. But when you have a less redundant space, um, community like this one, and you have another extinction, then you lose those functions because those, those functions were not very, very redundant. That was the case for the marine megafauna. As we show in this graph, most of the functional entities were filled by only one or two species. So of course, the effects on functional diversity were higher. But it seems that it's not the case for invertebrates. So we wanted to do this other study that is led also by Christine Bacon, in which we wanted to compare this with what occurred in the Caribbean with a mass extinction event in the Pleistocene. So this occurred in the Pleistocene. It affected 70% of Benthic communities, and it's thought that it occurred because when they, once the isthmus of Panama formed, the currents and all the climate and oceanographic conditions changed that caused this extinction. I'm not going to talk about this, but actually we think well, we have proved that the Isthmus of Panama formed much earlier, but I'm not going to go into details about this because we're interested about the effects of this extinction. 
So our colleague Austin Hendy collected this huge data set based on his own field work, but also museums and, and the literature. And we have this massive set of data with a lot of species and we run the same analysis. So we run the pirate analysis and we found that there were high extinction in the Pliocene and Pleistocene, but actually there was also a lot of origination. When we look at a net diversification curve, we find that actually there was a lot of diversity here in the Pliocene, but then a dramatic drop during the Quaternary. So we interpret this as a, a lot of turnover in the Pliocene, where actually there was positive diversification followed by an extinction event. Most interestingly, when we compare this with functional diversity, it's quite striking to see that this is the curve of the proportional, or the proportional diversity. We see that in, by the Pliocene, we reach the maximum levels, and then we lose 49% of biodiversity in the Quaternary. However, when we look at the functional space of the functional richness, it's actually not, doesn't experience any dramatic changes. Same for the numbers of functional entities. We do see a drop in the functional redundancy, but that makes plenty of sense because this is the number of species per function. So of course that drops. But the most interesting part of this graph is the functional vulnerability, which doesn't change much, of, if anything, it slightly increase at the end. This metric is the vulnerability. So how vulnerable are species or an ecosystem or a community to lose function, functions because of a species loss? So it accounts for how many functional entities are filled by only one or two species, meaning that they're very vulnerable to species loss. Well, this is maintained steady through time. This was not the case for marine megafauna. The vulnerability was really decreased. So in conclusion, what we found is that two extinction events, one of 30% of the species of the taxa, and the other one, 49%, had very different effects on functional diversity. When we lost 49% of mollusks, only 6% of the functional diversity was lost. Whereas when we lost 36% of marine megafauna, 16% of the functional diversity was lost. We think that this is because of redundancy. These mollusks were highly redundant. We had five to eight species per functional entity, whereas for marine megafauna, we only have one or two. So we propose that functional redundancy is very important for maintaining or for the consequences of extinction in marine ecosystems. And this is also very important for marine megafauna. It's showing that it's very vulnerable because there's just a few species filling different um, certain uh, functions. So it's highly vulnerable even nowadays. So with that, I would like to finish and not without thanking my collaborators. This is a very big project that we're running with a lot of people and also my host in my previous postdoc in Zurich and my current postdoc in Berlin. Thank you very much for listening. Catalina, we have uh, time for a question or two. I can take this one here first. Hi, um, I really enjoyed your talk, but I was wondering, does your marine megafauna data also include the um, tedious fishes data? No. Okay, because during that time is when you also see gigantism that evolves convergently and very rapidly in a number of groups of fishes, such as tunas and billfishes. Absolutely. Um, so I suspect they might actually have something to do with what is going on in some of the other groups, such as sharks and some of the marine mammals. But you won't see that in the fossil record because most of those guys have actually no fossil record whatsoever. But you do see that from molecular studies. Exactly. That's the answer to the question. We didn't have much of a fossil record to play with that. But yes, um, bony fishes will have been very important to account for it. Yeah. Um, did you also look at the extinction selectivity in earlier intervals than the pl uh, Pliocene Pleistocene for um, endothermic versus ectothermic organisms? So was that unique to the Pliocene Pleistocene that the endothermic yeah. extinct? Um, so we looked at the, f at the extinction rates through time, but then when we found that was the Pliocene and the Pleistocene the one, or the Pliocene, the one with the highest extinction, then we focused only on the Pliocene and Pleistocene. So we didn't account for endotherms and ectotherms for other periods, just for the Pliocene and Pleistocene, yeah. But it will be interesting to check that out because there was some, obviously, extinction going on back then. So it will be a good thing to do now. Okay, thanks very much. Sure.